I certainly have enjoyed uh, discussions today, and it's uh, my pleasure to be moderating the. F yeah, I don't think that's going to move. Uh, to be moderating our final panel. Um, this panel discussion uh, is actually an important discussion and topic at this point in time, and we want to be talking about labor market mobility by increasing partnerships between the public and the private sector both public and private education providers, and we've got an excellent lineup of speakers here for you today. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them just moving from this side to that side. So <laughs> Marilyn Harry, Vice President Academic of Centennial College, uh, also board member of eCampus Ontario, welcome. Darian Kovach, partner in Jelly Academy and Jelly Digital Marketing and PR and Chair, Digital Marketing Sector Council, welcome. And Jake Hirsch Allen, Workforce Development and Skills Lead for LinkedIn, in addition to uh, Lighthouse Learning Labs. So, how about you give me, uh, give them a round of applause and welcome for this discussion? <laughs> Thank you. You can certainly give me a round of applause too. I don't <laughs> mind that. <laughs> I was kidding, but thank you. You got one. You got I'll get you next. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, welcome everybody. Uh, actually, before I start. Second, I have selfie arms. You ready? Thank you. Um, so we're going to have a, a, I think, an interesting discussion. What? That was that was unexpected. Those are the best. Uh, You're so the best cool. Selfies. Look at your selfies. <laughs> Those who know me know that I've been doing selfies for like since the '80s. Wow. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's true. With like film cameras. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now you know too much about me. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about you, Marilyn. Uh, I want to get us started and talk about uh, the future of education and skills. And so our first discussion uh, point, and I'll ask each of you in, in turn to respond to it. So what does the future of education and skills training look like in a post-pandemic landscape characterized by pan-sector disruptions, such as the rise of generative AI? Well, it's a big question. I first want to say, I think it's very interesting that when we formed this panel talking about public-private partnerships, none of us could have foreseen what the future held. But, um, but I mean, that, I think that notion of anytime, anywhere learning became so real and visceral during the pandemic. And for faculty, I think it actually made them, I'm just speaking from Centennial's experience, more aversive to online learning, if anything, because it was so hard. Except that it wasn't really online learning, it was emergency teaching. For students, however, I think it completely transformed their expectations about what we need to do. And in relation to generative AI, I mean, it's changed everything, but what it hasn't changed is the prime piece around learning how to learn that notion of UNESCO's four pillars of education, right? Like learning how to know, learning how to do, but also learning how to live together and learning how to be. And that, that human connectedness also, I think, um, became so much more critically in front of us during those years. That's nicely said. Darian, how, how about you? I think if you, if you remember Sesame Street as a kid, if you, if you grew up with that show, it'd be like, this episode is brought to you by the letter do, 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 right? I think um, this disruption, it's brought to you by you know, nimbleness and quickness and change. And so I think today's discussion is so important, talking to so many folks here who are micro-credential creators or in a university that's like, what does this look like? Uh, I love Rhonda's idea this morning about the, the challenge to create a 16-week you know, course right, for Upskill Canada. And so, those that are saying, okay, we're gonna build something, but it's gonna have an expiry date on it in like six months, for most post-secondary, that's really devastating yeah. and it's, it's an unimaginable. But the idea of being like, okay, I can make something quick, I can make it for industry, and I can make it with industry, knowing that there's an expiry label on it because things shift so much. And so we work with a couple of universities right now where we have a course every quarter, we send it out to industry, they review it and they always come back with like four or five changes. But thanks to all these LMS tools and devices, we can go in and change little sections of it, update needs that the industry has, and then the university keeps the key learning objective, uh, you know, purpose and framework they need to have. And, but we figure out how to work within it. 
but, but it really sucks in a lot of ways because we used to be able to build these beautiful pieces, put it out there and be like, oh, I built it and they will come and it will be gorgeous and it will stay there. But now we're always having to iterate, uh, but it's having to be smarter about it. Well said. So this, uh, this forum is brought to you by, either by the letter M for micro-credential or the letter I for iteration. Yeah. Uh, but nicely said about the connection between uh, businesses and education. Jake, or what are e your thoughts? E for eCampus? Hmm? Yeah. E for eCampus? E for eCampus. I didn't want to be obvious, but thanks for saying that. <laughs> of course. Um, I come to the conversation from a few different perspectives. I think as a teacher and as someone who cares most about the social impact of education over people's lives, as opposed to what most people identify me with, which is LinkedIn and the jobs that will come out of that education, I was almost not just disappointed but devastated by the end of the pandemic at what had come of online learning because I had spent over a decade, almost two decades, obsessed with this idea that by creating some form of hybrid learning, we would be advancing pedagogy, we'd be advancing education. Mm -hmm. And I think there are examples of that in the sense of, I mean, I'm very proud of both what Lighthouse Labs has built and in what it's done online, including in collaboration with almost everyone up here. I'm also proud of the quality of the content on LinkedIn Learning. I think we have sort of Hollywood quality compelling content, not to compete with post-secondaries in any way. It's really sort of in the flow of work, how to use Excel or whatever, as opposed to a university or college level course. But at the same time, I think we made promises. Uh, most folks in EdTech made promises that not only weren't delivered on, but actually may have made things worse. Uh, and to pick up your UNESCO reference, I was at the UNESCO Digital Learning Week in Paris about nine months ago, and the keynote was this half hour long presentation of a classic UN 500 page report that was structured brilliantly. It was called The Tragedy of EdTech, and it had beautiful graphic design, and it was literally sculpted like a Greek tragedy. And it showed how in country after country, education outcomes had become worse with the introduction of EdTech rather than better. And of course, there's a bunch of other conditions, a pandemic, that could have been at fault. Um, but I think that there is a degree of realism that has come into education about the value of in-person and how that shouldn't be a privilege just for those with the resources to pay for it, but rather how it is fundamental. Interacting with other human beings in person is fundamental to education. Yeah. Fantastic. Did you want to respond to that? No, I okay. think you said it. You said it beautifully, <laughs> Jake. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit now about uh, disruption. I want to, uh, and the, the importance of those connections into the labor market. We've heard about that all day. Uh, Stephen Murphy, uh, president of Ontario Tech and uh, co-chair of eCampus Ontario, started the day by saying that this is a moment uh, of change. The, and Anne-Marie Vaughan, president of Humber College, talked about how you in the room are the change makers. So let's, and uh, um, Marilyn, you talked a little bit about uh, online. You've just mentioned it as well. So let's kind of push into that a little bit and talk about how we structure learning that takes into account the digital, the face-to-face, -face, multiple providers, the work-integrated learning. So what would you say to that? Darian, let's start with you. Yeah, what we're seeing more and more is, and I actually I've got this analogy from you, is the idea of Lego. And I know we may have bad memories of stepping on it late at night, or you like, but if you remember like, these beautiful building bricks and, and the idea that we can work with different organizations out there, whether it's LinkedIn Learning is that little stud that goes in here, and you take this course over there, you, you do this course at university, and then you take this micro-credential over there, but you can build these amazing creations. I think that was one of the greatest things that I think that did come out of COVID was all the opportunities that are around us in the globe and it made all of us and challenged us all to be better at it. And it challenged us all to say, okay, what do specific learners need? What systems do they need in place? And what community do you need around you to make that happen? So wraparound services became even more important. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea of, okay, one organization, it's like I'm not gonna work at one corporation for the rest of my life, like my dad or my grandpa, but I'm gonna work at multiple places and I'm gonna learn in multiple uh, arenas. Maybe I can jump in with an example of how we're actually working together. So uh, there are a number of courses where folks are going from Jelly Academy to Lighthouse Labs and then into a public post-secondary, mm -hmm. or they're going from an indigenous institution 
into Lighthouse Labs and then to Jelly Academy. And I think it is those links between the public and private sector that need to be enhanced because people have this picture of competition that is almost, in my opinion, entirely artificial. The vast majority of us are going to learn in some, like at some point in our lives from public institutions, I hope we all learn from public institutions, mm -hmm. as well as at some point from private institutions. And they can actually augment each other with everything from data, which I hope is always open, but of course it's not, and content, which again, I would argue should be open. Um, and so a couple other examples, and in Washington State we had this proposal where every library already has LinkedIn Learning, and in fact, in a lot of uh, library systems, Ontario is another one, we are the most used online resource in the library. So you people walk into the library, if they're looking at a computer screen, chances are they're using LinkedIn Learning. But they're using it usually to get skills for a job, not for the sort of traditional library purpose of finding books and broader education and learning. And that is a signal to the librarians that they need help getting a job. And a lot of these folks need another human being to help them get that job. LinkedIn and LinkedIn Learning can't do it on their own. And so the idea was, as soon as the librarian sees that, they can offer for them to go to their local, in America it's called a Workforce Development Board, in Canada it would be an employment service organization, to get help from a human being with figuring out what job they want, but also to get food stamps or bus passes, to get the other resources, as you said, the social determinants or the wraparounds necessary to get them into that job. And then, ideally, from that workforce board, they're going to a community college or a university, right? They're continuing their learning. And so it's creating these pathways through different forms of education that are both public and private that I think are really valuable. And maybe I'll end on one that actually steps a little bit outside of the world of education into the world of the labor market. Because to be frank, the reason LinkedIn is so dominant is because it has figured out that connection to employers mm -hmm. in a really effective manner. And I think the post-secondaries that do that are going to be the ones that succeed. Uh, I'm super honored to be on the board of Ontario Tech Talent, which is a spin-off of Ontario Tech University, the brainchild of Stephen Murphy. And what they're doing super well is exactly that, working with employers to work back from their needs to create micro-credentials and then delivering that education in the format that those employers want with the validation on an ongoing basis from them. I think those are such good examples, both of you, because students, in a way, have already figured it out. I mean, they decide which, um, which modules or micro-credentials or platforms that they will access, and they do that in ways that may or may not complement their curriculum because they're doing this to augment and enhance. So they're figuring out ways to combine those Lego blocks. Um, and there are also combinations that may not be apparent to them that our own structures may be obstructing. Mm. An example of that, I was talking to a young woman this week who works full time at Centennial in a min role. She's doing her master's in education um, leadership and is a, a TikTok influencer with 100,000 followers um, on makeup tutorials and beauty. And her interest, her passion is about inclusion and inclusive leadership in education. Mm. She's like, you know, and I have this TikTok account and I, the swag is coming to my door, but I really, I don't know how to connect these. And we started talking about inclusive beauty, which is huge, hugely important and influential. And so how, how are we creating that porosity across all, all levels of platforms, public providers, public education in ways that support learners' pathways, mm -hmm. their aspirations? Good job using the description in your Porosity. 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 <laughs> I did it. I used the word. Thank you. Well done. Uh, great point about inclusion and, and also the fact that students have already figured it out. What then are some of the obstacles? You mentioned some of the structures could be... We don't make it easy. I mean, th like try t transferring from one program to another within an institution. How many credits are you going to get? Try transferring from the same program to another public institution or college to university. A little easier from university to college, but not always. And then layer in, um, oh, we, I mean, at Centennial, we integrate micro-credentials within courses. But I think about, so we talk about curricular, co-curricular micro-credentials. But what about pre-curricular or, or anti-curricular? I mean, there, there's so many opportunities. But, our structures, we talk about being student-centered, but to what extent are we radically student-centered? How would that really galvanize change? 
Totally. I mean, I think a great example is one of the sponsors today is Redocracy, and I've been advising them for a while. But what I loved about the fundamental sort of or origin story of Redocracy is we spend so much time on the internet consuming content, learning in one form or another, and not necessarily knowing, maybe having an intuition, but certainly not evidence of what's good for us and what's bad for us, and of how that's building, of how, in essence, we are creating the equivalent of certificates or degrees in our own minds, but again, aren't evaluating whether they're helping or hurting us in a variety of ways, right? They could be junk food versus healthy food. I think that analogy is actually true throughout our lives and our education. And Canada is amongst the worst places for it, right? We know that employers do a terrible job of on-the-job training here. We know that even individuals don't seek out education as much in Canada as they do in many other countries in the OECD. And I don't blame the public post-secondaries for that. I blame a much broader cultural understanding of the value of education as something that happens literally all the time in our everyday interactions and which could be improved. Darian? Yeah. I'd say, you know, to go along with porosity, I think one of the biggest obstacles we have is, is ego. Like, I think I'm going to come at it from the micro-credential side of running a kind of a private boot camp. You know, we get so much fanfare and people love us and we've done this great work and we start believing what's in the media and we start believing what people tell us and we think we don't need anyone else. So when it comes to partnering with a university or college, it's like, well, I don't need you, right? And so that's that obstacle of ego. And then when it comes to speaking from the sector council, there's so much impatience amongst the sector councils. When we meet, it's like, well, I've tried talking to that university and working with them, but they didn't move quick enough, or I need workers now, or I need them to listen to what we're doing, and I need them to build a course with these credentials so I will hire them, but they don't listen. Um, and so being able to take away impatience and ego, it's just human traits. But if we can see ego fall down a bit, and see us boot camps working with universities, there's some amazing partnerships that can happen. We've got one right now with UVic where we're coming to them and students can now actually take our course, it's beautiful, go it, then get a job, and once they're done the job, they go right into a management and leadership course through the university. And then it's through their continuing ed, and then they ladder from that into a degree program. And it's this beautiful idea of saying, what if we really needed each other? And what if we had a purpose, and you have a purpose, but together we can be awesome. Um, and then on the sector council side, it was just having to <laughs> encourage all of us sector council people to say, all right, if we could slow down and work in the flow and the motion of a university college, the results are incredible. So we've been able to develop a couple programs within universities and colleges where we said, hey, here's the labor market needs. It's still a bit awkward on like the quarterly requests because it's like we're not used to it, but on the micro-credential side, that's the hope is when labor market needs come to you and have quarterly updates, being able to embrace it and figure out ways to adjust through some LMS tools. Thank you all. I, we heard uh, Kevin from the U Texas system today talk a little bit about the, like the system-wide approach to integration of micro-credentials. I also happened to uh, sit in on Kelly Archer's uh, presentation <laughs> about the job bank and providing uh, labor market information to people to empower them to make informed choices. So maybe I'll, uh, and, and I would just say at least 12 of you in this room have been asked this question by me today, which is, what did you study in school? Yeah. Hmm. Right. So what did you study? Uh, I made up a major at U of T. Hmm. Uh, I, so, Why so am I, I not surprised? I, I, got, I got to U of T and I was, uh, frustrated because there was this incredible course book of a thousand courses and part of why I didn't go to a small liberal arts college is because I loved the breadth of offerings at this massive institution where I think most people felt lost, right? Like yeah. most people at least at that in those years at U of T were not happy students and I was overjoyed because it was a cornucopia of offerings and then I earmarked almost every page in the thousand page book with one course on that page that I wanted to take and of course I could only take whatever, 40 or 50 of them over the course of my degree. So I took my 10 favorites in the first year and the administration said this is not a degree or this is like these are just random <laughs> courses that you all took. Um, you could get found, a degree in random. Uh, I think that's what I want my PhD to be in at least yeah. in like a conversational structure sort of like that. But I found the dean of New College who was a Jungian psychoanalyst and she helped me create a major called archetypal mythology which was the fundamental narratives that underlie our society. Dang. And so it included classical mythology and 
the, a class on the Quran and a class on the Bible and a class on children, children's literature, and they all work together to create a liberal arts degree. So yeah. you're, you're the prototype of the, the Lego. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Lego. Yeah. Precisely. Um, it's no accident, by the way, that the root of le uh, Lego is the root of a Latin word called pro legomena, which means to start. Um, a little random piece of tidbit. Uh, well, but here's what just I wanted pulled to that out. Only you pulled Robert it out. Have, I like Lego. Yeah. But here's what I wanted to ask a question. This is what I've asked people, um, many people. So what skills did you learn? For, no, mm. not enough skills did you learn. Did anybody in your degree program tell you what skills you learned? No. How about you? No. Marilyn? I, I, social work, and I, I should say yes, but... I, in retrospect, not really. Right. A little bit. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. So it, 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 I, we were talking earlier, Darian, and I, I think of this as a product market fit problem, right? We are mm -hmm. selling content, yeah. but people are buying skills, mm -hmm. or they want skills, and they deploy skills in the labor market. So, Marilyn, you, in, earlier you said that, that students have figured this out. They're going through and they're trying to learn mm -hmm. skills and competencies to demonstrate those. So besides giving everybody the Lego experience mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of a degree, which I, are there any uh, registrars in the room? <laughs> <laughs> any Jungian analyst registrars? Yes, yeah. There you go. I know you're here. Um, so well, so if, if students are already picking this path themselves, what can we do to get out of their way and to enable it? I, it is about getting out of their way, but I think it's also about, about interrogating how we're organizing you mentioned ego, Darian. Mm -hmm. I, I, that makes me also think about elitism and how yeah. there is this kind of hierarchy of credentials. What's at the top? Hmm. Like, and what's, what's right at the bottom? And I, I really think that, and that's true in colleges, I think, as much as universities. And yet for students, they are deciding what is right for them at this time or what they can afford that's going to get them that one step closer to realizing their aspirations. And maybe if we started to dismantle that professional elitism, disciplinary elitism, credential elitism, might that start to change how we resource different areas, different kinds of um, courses that may attract different faculty? Like I think that, that may be a way into some different conversations. I mean, there's irony in the elitism that I think is lost even on the people who are sort of most proud of it or promulgating it the most. So teachers are undervalued by teachers, right? Like they're, the, the post-secondaries themselves are putting teaching often much lower on the hierarchy of skills than law or other things, which in my opinion are, if anything, higher in terms of their impact on society. And in some ways that's Canadian, in some ways that's sort of like a global, I think, human phenomenon. But there's a, a bunch of fantastic lessons coming out of Paul LeBlanc, a um, university president from the States who's been talking about how the most important lesson of AI is that more and more of our technical skills are going to be, in some ways, taken over by machines, which just reinforces the human skills, obviously. And it also specifically reinforces the care parts of the economy. It reinforces the social workers. All of those human interactions are dominated by people who care in one way or another. And if we don't, then I think we should honestly be paying the person less. If it doesn't have that empathy or human interaction component, then let's start rebalancing the labor market because the computer can do some of that. So being uh, Métis myself, and we own a training institute, we work with a lot of Métis students, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and they have a, an organization within different parts of the country called ISET offices. So. Uh, indigenous skills and employment training and there are these amazing offices and they have this mandate from the federal government to find uh, skills and employment training and so um, we hosted the first national gathering of them across Canada and one of the things I'm hearing from the ISET holders right across the country is too many universities and colleges love them because they have so much money like one ISET alone is around 17 million dollars a year but they, this last year, I won't say which one, gave back $4 million. Because they were just like, we are really concerned about sending our people, our community, into these schools because they don't realize we need employment and we need skills outcomes. And so, but I think this is where universities and colleges have this massive advantage is that 
being indigenous myself, and most of our students are indigenous, there are certain people, I don't know if you know this, but there's certain companies and people that aren't as excited about indigenous people for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so they're not as excited about hiring. And so they like, they're supposed to, but they're like not, they're cautious or they're scared or they don't, they don't have any indigenous friends and they're like, this is a strange experience for me. And so we're working on that. But what you can do is if you can give like this really badass university college brand to a micro credential, that has skills and employment outcomes, that is the most beautiful mix. That's better than what we can do. Because we're like a, you know, a little private training institute that's providing this for people and giving them this opportunity. But you as a university and college, giving them that beautiful brand that's putting that kind of stamp of approval on an indigenous person saying like, this person's awesome, we vouch for them. That's what your brand can do. And you give a micro-credential that's employment focus and skills focus, like that's awesome. Like you can do that. And so that's where I just think my challenge is, is saying, hey, if you go forward in that, that's what ICED offices are looking for. They're looking for those partners that believe in that and, and will listen to them. And if you can then make sure that it, you have that connection to the job outcomes and you've got those employers excited. And then even maybe, and this is one thing that we've seen in a few schools, actually provide that like indigenous hiring experience learning to be like, hey, when someone, uh, and like this is what, I'm not, we had someone be like, hey, we hired you know, two of our grads, and buddy's like, hey, it's been awesome, thank you so much, it's been great. One of them, they'll want it, like a time off because their aunt died. Like, why is an aunt, in, like, I don't get why, it's like an aunt. It's not like it was a mom or dad. I was like, well, just you know, here's like kind of auntie culture, and this is how it works. And it was like this really cool moment. This person's like, I did not know that about aunties. Okay, I got this. And so he actually sent me a couple weeks later, they, their HR handbook goes, if your auntie or your uncle, and he was like, they added it to the book. And I'm like, come on, that's cool. That is pretty cool. I heard a great presentation today by our colleagues, Lori uh, and uh, Kim from uh, Oshke Pemashowin, yeah. and talked a lot about uh, access and how uh, micro-credentials are providing excellent uh, inroads to uh, to folks in their communities, 49 communities, I think you serve, yeah. over a, a geography the size of France yeah. in, in one location, under-resourced, by the way. I don't know if you know this, but I learned this a little while ago, but uh, Indigenous institutes are only guaranteed 25% of their funding at the beginning of each fiscal year, and so they have to go and find the rest of that funding uh, every year. Uh, that's not a good thing for a community or, or a people who we actually have a legal obligation to support through education. Uh, so the fact that uh, Ashki Pameshawin is doing such a great job on supporting folks with micro-credentials, I think, you know, deserves to be, uh, to be celebrated. Uh, but let's talk uh, a moment about how micro-credential programs, then to broaden that out a bit, can provide pathways to anybody who is, who is left out of, out of education. Jake? Yeah, happy to jump in. I think we can start really young. Uh, about five, ten years ago, there was a really interesting partnership where a lot of K-12 systems mm -hmm. wanted to bring coding education into their schools. It was all the rage, code.org, etc. And what folks were realizing, both from a pedagogical perspective more broadly and specifically in terms of the skills they needed to get into either post-secondaries or right into employment was it was actually computational thinking. It was this idea of thinking logically, et cetera, not knowing how to code. That was the important part. And so Lighthouse Labs worked with BCIT and the BC government to create a curriculum that didn't sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater, but rather just adapted the existing K-12 curriculum in BC to include what BCIT saw as the right pedagogical approach to computational thinking. And it's that kind of sort of tripartite relationship that I think is super, super valuable. Another a good example from the States um, is this creation called Futuro Health, uh, where Kaiser Permanente, the largest health company in the country, worked with SEIU, the largest health union in the country, personal support workers uh, and others, in order to create a career pathway through the California Community College System where you didn't actually have to even get the certificate. All you had to do was prove to the union that you had the skills that they would require for you to do on the job with Kaiser Permanente. And the union skipped the whole certification process of the CCs, and the CCs were okay with it because they got paid by Kaiser and the union. And the person was bypassed through a bunch of the interviews that we saw as being key areas where discrimination happened in the Kaiser Permanente hiring pipeline. And so you got rid of a bunch of these different barriers throughout the system, from union membership mm -hmm. to interviewing to the actual credential from the community college system, and resulted in way more marginalized populations getting into these jobs. 
and just more people employed, period. Darren. As, like Alejandro Sierra in the front from Indigenous Friends Association, like they go and they like kind of parachute in communities and embrace people with these like hands-on learning experiences. And so I think it's just a great example of saying like, we're not gonna say you have to come to me and you have to apply and come to into my fortress and climb this tower, <laughs> right? And be like, and dress a certain way. You gotta wear knight's clothing, maiden clothing. Which by the way, I went to that medieval thing last week here in, yeah, yeah. I went to it for a friend's birthday. I've never been. <laughs> I, it's, it was wild, there's actual horses. And, but I learned, you can't, I thought you could eat the food and throw it over your shoulder. I'm not supposed to throw the bone over your shoulder. Um, but it was amazing. like full dress, right? But so, but Alejandro's like, no, you come as you are. You want to wear whatever you want. You wear moccasins. You want to wear pants. Yeah, you should wear pants. But like, <laughs> wear what pants you want. Um, and powers here in the house. I don't know where they are now. But like, the work they're doing to just make uh, tech accessible is, is incredible. And I think two organizations here, Upskill Canada, Digital, no longer super cluster. I don't know why you dropped that. It's kind of fun to say. Um, they went out and found people that were making it accessible. And, and then they challenged it to say like, hey, we're only going to fund you or we're going to challenge to fund you to A, find a consortium, do it in partnership, but also we're going to challenge you to like get them jobs and get them raises. And it's like these great organizations that actually like sought out people that were on the margins doing really cool stuff. And so... It's been so neat to watch what they're funding and what they're making happen, and even building partnerships between really special people. So I just think in this room alone, there's some uh, amazing examples. And then I think one of the neat things, we've because we have a sector council that advises on a school, this school came to us and said, hey, one of our biggest issues is hardware. Like, the kids aren't able to get, like, because we recruited, like, 40 indigenous students to this program, of which only six had, like, a really good working laptop and a phone. So Best Buy was on the advisory group and they've hired two of our students so we just put it out to the group anyone have tips on let and salsa and best buy was like however many laptops you want however many phones you want we're in so they've donated like 280 cell phones and laptops to any indigenous student that needs hardware amazing so it's one of those because they believe in what they get out of it because there's you know selfishly they get rad students that they get to hire who are indigenous and awesome storytellers because they have this great superpower yeah well, it's a win-win yeah. Marilyn. But, Darren, you could be the narrator for Medieval Times. <laughs> <laughs> like the way you were talking about the night and stuff. But, well, I think our, our partnership, our initiative with Airframe Assembly at Centennial with Upskill, that's super exciting and it's so accessible. Anyone can step into that career and, and that may lead to further administration or higher education so many different pathways. And this is a little bit outside the box, but similar to the U of T, I think, experience that our micro-credentials, the majority of them, with a couple of exceptions, are more successful internationally than they are mm. locally. But the revenue from that is also supporting further creation and development and partnership development. So, I, I mean, it's a global marketplace it's a global workforce so that's that's kind of cool too yeah which is a great uh great reason to be working together we only have a few minutes left and i want to turn it up to some uh, questions from the audience so we have one right here medieval times question or credentials? <laughs> Brought to you by the letter M for medieval. Thanks. Actually, something that uh, Darian said early on about the iteration of micro-credentials. And I'm just wondering, is there a risk for people that want to stay relevant um, feeling stress and fear about needing to keep re-upping on micro-credentials? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it's as much as a fear as most schools these days, like Lighthouse Labs is a good example, like they bring the alumni together, they have these alumni connections, so once you leave these schools that are more into like the upskilling kind of future skills or kind of like new collar employment worlds, they're all doing those upskilling for you, so it's almost like when you got Microsoft Windows back in the day and they would send you updated, remember like, remember those, they'd send you the CD-ROMs and you'd be like, update your Windows from 95 to 97, like, I think it's like, we didn't worry about the 97 update. Like we could still download LimeWire and Napster. Remember we'd like play King's Quest. But like, I think most schools though these days that have it, as long as they're aware of it and they're updating their students. And most of the times once they've gone through your school, they're in an employment place anyways. So ideally the employer is taking advantage of the Canada Jobs Grant 
and using that kind of ten thousand dollars a year to upgrade their employees with those credentials. I mean, what's amazing is how many different grants the federal yeah. government and provincial governments have created in order to try to encourage people either to do lifelong learning or to do some form of going back to school and updating, and how little uptake there is. Oh yeah. And it's again, it's a cultural issue in Canada, but. The answer is not fear. I mean, I think I, I fear how fast tech is changing. That is a much bigger macro global problem that I think is tied to financial markets and a bunch of other things. But within Canada, the real problem is that we're just not doing it enough. We, like, we all do have to constantly be learning, and some of it's going to be formal and some of it's going to be informal. But like, Jen and I did change a bunch of aspects of how our lives are going to work in the next little while, and there's going to be something else in six months to two years when this hype cycle dies down. And I think it behooves Canada to keep up with that, right? We have, in some cases, the best of these systems. Like our higher education system in the traditional sense is amongst the best in the world. Mm -hmm. So why do we have this huge gap between the best research universities and polytechnics and in some cases community colleges in the world and the worst on the job, lifelong, continuing learning? Another question over here? Oh, hi, sorry, I just, um Marilyn, I think you mentioned the idea of a radically student-centered micro-credential, and I just wondered if I could hear a little bit more about that, or we could hear a little bit more about that. What characteristics might a radically student-centered micro-credential have? Well, I guess I'm thinking about that um, theories of teaching and learning and pedagogies, and we've been talking about constructivist pedagogy for decades now, and then latterly pedagogy and pedagogy, that sort of notion of students at the center and decolonizing our classrooms and our spaces. And I think it, it's almost like this conceptual leap to organize curriculum around the students' needs, to collaborate with students in co-creating curriculum. Mm -hmm. And some of the um, work that we're doing with indigenous colleagues, leaders, educators, around indigenization of curriculum is actually creating radically student-centered pedagogies um, in ways that these other Western Eurocentric terms like pedagogy, pedagogy like it just never quite landed. Um, I'm not sure that that really gets at the question, but I think there is a pathway into this work through reconciliation and indigenous sovereignty and co-creation. Like that, that is where I think we're seeing some traction in our curriculum. I have a weird example, um, and it's the opposite, I think, of what you're asking for. Um, intentionally to like belie what, what could be the right way. So the wrong way was demonstrated by this prof at U of T, Paolo, where he intentionally had a course submitted and then approved by the administration at U of T to teach Gen AI would do all the teaching, so it would be prompts in, and the only thing students would see would be Gen AI, and the only thing that students could respond with was a prompt and then the output. So you basically had like a computer talking to a computer for the entire course. And it was fascinating, I think, as a construct to like what not to do, in <laughs> as what not to do in education, but it also was fascinating as a really fast way for faculty members to realize what the potential threats and upsides of this technology were. And what it made me think as the question was asked was like, what if we had a student, like if students themselves were way, way more involved in the constant recreation of not every course, but like one course within their curriculum, and that you could actually use that course as the seeding ground for so many other ideas that could then permeate their self-designed degree or something. That's so cool. Well, they're content creators themselves. I've Course Hero, perfect example. Like, we're pulling the content down. B good luck with that, right? Yeah. But they are themselves creating this content and sharing it openly. So how do we, it's sort of like Gen AI. We're not now talking about um, how do we prevent it. Not possible, not desirable. Um, but how, how do we adapt to it? and in ways that are actually going to enhance Yeah, what if I guess like every student in every class was using Readocracy to create their own micro-credentials, which then the other students in the class had to take. And like, you can imagine in a class for teachers, at least, that would be a pretty productive way of doing peer-to-peer -peer learning. Hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Jenny? Okay, hi. Um, sorry. Oh, okay, we have two more questions. Microphone. Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I can see you. Um, so my question is, 
the, the conversation about the access and the availability and the student-led and the individual directed learning is amazing. And the opportunities of, um, yeah, just the opportunities are phenomenal. But access without quality is kind of a cruel deception. Yeah. And so I was, wondered, I was wondering if you could maybe share your thoughts on what sort of infrastructures are, are needed or what sort of pieces need to be in place to ensure that students are making informed decisions and that learners are making informed decisions about the investment that they're making both in time and money. Mm. Who would like to pick that up? Wow, yeah. well I feel like I should, can take a crack at it, but the, it, that's I think such an excellent question on so many levels because when we talk about our enrollment projections and the viability of our programs, we're not really thinking about it necessarily um, at an institution level in as much, what is that quality, that value to each and every student as we could and should, and yet at the same time we also are through the advising conversations that are happening throughout their journey, pre, during, post. So, I mean, I, I Welcome others' thoughts because I'm, that's it's such an important question. And go back to the I said, like it, it depends who the filter is. Like an I said office is saying, okay, what are the job outcomes? Who's on your advisory board? The, let me meet some of your alumni. And I think that's their quality control. Is this an actual course like basket weaving, right? Taking through this thing, or this is like Sammy just built a new micro credential in his basement and he's selling like this course. But I think that's the power of you in this room, the universities, the colleges. You have this amazing ability to be that quality control. You add that viability, you add that kind of stamp of approval that gives you your superpower. That is your, that's, that's your superpower right now. And so being able to put them through your filter. Uh, allows that and, and thank you for that and making sure that people don't take basket weaving and be told there's lots of jobs in basket weaving. I promise <laughs> you, look at this out there. But there's oh. like, there's a brand new eCampus app that will now allow you to put in every Ontario micro-credential and see what the labor market outcomes of it are. And I think that is not hard to build evidently because I think you all built it in a matter of weeks. Uh, maybe it's hard because it takes the knowledge of micro-credentials and of the labor market um, in order to put it together, but technologically, it's not as challenging. So I think what we need now is to, like, I guess it's encourage and support students with their access to that information. Um, Andre Cote and I wrote a paper for the dais on labor market outcomes, and there really aren't a lot of data on labor market outcomes, isn't a lot, um, particularly from Canadian public post-secondaries, uh, particularly research institutions. And it, if you just look south of the border at a place where, you know, uh, the majority of institutions are private, and yet we still have more data on their employment outcomes than we do Canada's public institutions. Um, it, it belies how big that gap in, in information is. In fact, a Canadian who's now a venture capitalist in the States named Ryan Craig described the information asymmetry that students have when interacting with institutions and how, in many cases, if you just looked at that information asymmetry, it really would look like post-secondaries are taking advantage of their students by not revealing what their employment outcomes are, in part because of this, I think, well-founded belief that they're providing a lot of things other than just skills and jobs, and in part because they're worried that those employment outcomes aren't what they should be. Colleges do. Colleges do a much better job. <laughs> Jenny, over to you for the last question, and we'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much for this panel. So, I think one of the things that really I felt a lot today was not just micro credentials, right? And uh, Kelvin's like hand them out, you know, like candy or drugs or whatever. Here's a credential. Here's one for you. But it's the it's the wraparound value proposition that that folks who are who are delivering, and especially those who are delivering to to mar most marginalized people, the unemployed and folks who really need that learning to skill up. Um, so I'm wondering how you can frame in public-private context the value proposition for a learner. What is it that you're bringing? Uh, are you bringing your industry connections? Are you bringing uh, funding, offering this for no cost, extra supports, those kinds of things? Like, I feel like post-secondary is going to have to get better at saying what the value they're bringing to the table. If, if knowledge is free and easy to get to, especially with AI moving in and disrupting, what are you bringing to the table for me as a learner 
that really matters to me. And I think learners are going to become much more discerning about what That's that a is. Fantastic point. I mean, I think the higher you go on Maslow's hierarchy, the harder it is to prove that value because it becomes more unique and individual and less concrete. And in the States, for the average community college, it's therefore in many ways a lot easier, right? If half of Americans don't get beyond high school education, then getting to community college often means getting a food stamp or a bus pass or family support payments, those wraparound services in a really literal, concrete way. In Canada, way fewer people need those things, thankfully. And so instead, we're up a level above. Now we need to prove that they are going to get skills and a job, that they're going to learn about how to learn and about life and about how to support their families better. And I think that is harder. And we don't think enough about communicating that when you ask the question, how many of us were taught what skills we were learning in school? That's not hard to do. In fact, there's like remarkable uses of AI right now to run thousands of syllabi through an LLM. Even before LLMs were created, you could just use simple natural language processing on it. And it tells the teacher what they're teaching so that they can then communicate that to the student. Right? Um, I think that is a good beginning, but it's obviously just the beginning of what you're asking about. We did a study, we looked at 83 different universities across Canada and looked at if they, in the business school specifically, if they told us as the potential student who their advisory council was. There was actual three that actually told us. They actually listed their names and said, this is who we ad advises us. And I was shocked. So I think that is one of the greatest values you have. And, and again, there's enough ego, in, you know, we talked about ego earlier, there's enough ego in people that's like, oh, you're going to let me be on your advisory? Of course I will. Like, you have a much better ability uh, than a lot of folks do. And so being able to make this advisory council, and, and don't just make it two or three, like, you can bring 25 people with 25 different perspectives on there. And that, and here's the, the double win there, as you know, the win, 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 is that A, you get brilliant insight and advice. But then those 25, at least you can be like, well, at least we got 25 people that might hire our grads. And then there's an organization here called Ripen that you might say, okay, I've seen a lot of schools now say, hey, you get a Ripen experience, right? Or you get a work experience, but here's what it actually looks like. So clarifying that is a huge value. I know we're, we're over time, but I want to go one thing that everyone who designs a microcred 30 know, seconds. Less than 30 seconds, okay? At Lighthouse Labs and so many of the other successful schools, you spend a quarter of your money on marketing and you spend ballpark numbers, a quarter of your money on career services. That blows away what any post-secondary, public post-secondary in the country does. And it's the career services part that matters a ton. Mm -hmm. Invest in your career service human beings and you will end up with better employment outcomes. Marilyn, last word to you. Come well, on. mine was more prosaic. I, we talked about this before. It was a one-click experience. Like, students are searching around and scavenging, finding things. Like, what if it were more seamless? So that's one click. Fantastic. So our logo for the Micro-Credential Forum is a light bulb, and I'm reminded of the, the saying that the light bulb was not invented by continuous improvement of the candle. And this uh, <laughs> panel is <laughs> so profound. Yeah, right? well put. <laughs> you got to drop your little hand. You yeah. could take this up. Like a micro. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm trying to wrap up here, uh, but thank you. Um, really appreciate the discussion. This has been fantastic. We did go a little bit over time. I want to thank everybody for uh, coming and uh, being part of today's uh, discussion. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. But before I do that, please give me, uh, help me give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you, Robert. The candle and uh, the light bulb, that's going to be a tough one to top over here in our closing remarks. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to our volunteers. And more particularly, thank you to Michael, Paul, Cindy, Salmaz, and Lutfia. And if you're here, please stand up so we can give you a round of applause. So again, thank you to all our volunteers, our sponsors, our vendors, our presenters, and of course you, our attendees, for being here today online or in person. And so now, what's next? In a not too distant future, I'll start by inviting you to join us at our networking event. It will be right over here on your 
well, on my right-hand side and probably on your left-hand side, and uh, more good food, some wine, good people, great view, and a photo booth. It's here until 6 p.m., so if you haven't gotten your photo just yet, now's your chance. Um, and then for the longer term, as we look uh, towards the future of developing tomorrow's workforce, I'd like to invite you to take some time to reflect on the invaluable knowledge and insights shared here today. I'd like to share with you one of my favorite Latin quotes. Aut viam inveniam, aut faciam. I shall either find a way or make one. For me, this quote symbolizes determination, persistence, and innovation on an individual level, and I found it very, very pertinent to all the wonderful work that everyone is doing here. And as a cohesive group of determined and persistent innovators de dedicated to finding career paths for learners, and if these career paths did not exist prior, these innovators are creating them by seeking solutions to develop the next generation of talent. So I'd like to invite you to reflect on this quote and what it may mean to you when considering on how you develop tomorrow's workforce. And let's continue the conversation. Sign up for our upcoming micro-credential events. Uh, I hear that there might be an email that you will be getting in the near future. Explore the expanded micro-credentials portal, portal microlearnontario.ca. And if you have any questions at all, please do contact us at micro at ecampusontario.ca. So just a couple of reminders before I hand it over to Elder Wabagoon. Uh, we do have a survey that you might have received in your inbox. We appreciate all the insights and suggestions that you have to share with us, and we can't wait to delve into your comments. Uh, I already mentioned the photo booth, so I'll jump to the third thing, uh, which is it was an honor to be here with you today. And thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. And I would like to invite Elder Wabagoon. Thank you.